for the first time ever, you can have production and uh, uh, conservation happening on the same hectare uh, of land. Currently, uh, at the Land Institute, we're working on perennial wheat, uh, sorghum for grain sorghum, uh, sunflower and, and species related to sunflower. And we're working with the uh, Yunnan Academy of Agricultural Sciences in their uh, efforts to produce perennial rice. Uh, around the world, there are others who are working on uh, other perennial species. Uh, uh, perennial rye, uh, pigeon pea, and, uh, and other species, and we're uh, encouraging uh, breeders around the world to add uh, new species to that uh, list of crops that we're working on. The time that it's going to take will vary from species to species. We have one relative of uh, perennial wheat, which is called Kernza, or intermediate wheatgrass, uh, that species probably within a decade will be ready to be used on the landscape to produce a, a product very much like wheat, but uh, with all of the ecological uh, advantages of a, a perennial species. Perennial cropping system hold a tremendous potential in the world to increase food security, to retain soils, to help increasing resilience to climate change. So this is why we in FAO decided to hold a meeting to bring together scientists, so social scientists, soil experts, agroforestry system experts, perennial crop, legume, oil seed experts, to talk together about the potential, what is known and what is not known about perennial crops and perennial cropping systems, and what remains to be done all together to bring this very promising and very important topic further and to improve many of our poor and depleted cropping systems by adding perennial crops into them. I became interested in perennial wheat um, because in the, uh, the course of my work on, on producing virus resistance for wheat, I had accumulated a large collection of wheat crosses to uh, and, uh, perennial triticy grasses, so they're perennial grasses. Um, and I, I did that because the perennial grasses are very rich in uh, disease resistance genes. But uh, many of those same grasses were also perennial and, uh, and the hybrids where the two genomes were combined proved to be perennial as well. So we pursued this and I worked together with colleagues uh, in Australia and overseas and the basic uh, conclusion that we came to was that you need to combine the whole genomes, all of the chromosomes of wheat with one genome from those perennial grasses in order to get a wheat-like plant that is able to regrow over three or four years. You know, we are facing some great problem with nutritional um, quality of wheat. There are a lot of people with a problem with uh, gluten. At least 10% of the people uh, show intolerance to gluten. This means that uh, this new material can even help uh, to solve this problem. We're working on um, converting annual wheat into a perennial crop. We do this both for the grain production but also the animal and forage use and, and straw and things like that as well. We've been working on perennial wheat for about 20 years. We have lines that do quite well. Um, we're, we're mostly interested in dual purpose grain at this point, which is giving farmers options, which they can grow it and just cut the grain and possibly save the straw or use the organic matter to put back into the field, or to cut as a green chop and then a grain, chop, a grain crop and then it continues to grow after the grain is harvested and use it again as a forage crop or something like that. So we're working with both short-lived, 
and long-lived plants. Some that go two years, others that may go five to eight or ten years in the field. Perennial grain crops are a potential strategy for uh, increasing yield in certain environments for uh, uh, farmers and also a good way for uh, reducing the amount of inputs for getting uh, uh, high yields. Um, two most important crops that humanity has are wheat and rice for subsistence and uh, both are active areas of research uh, in a number of groups. Um, rice is a particularly uh, interesting crop uh, for developing perennials in that it's already uh, uh, essentially a perennial crop that's being grown as an annual. And so a very traditional practice for rice has been uh, retuning, where after the initial crop, uh, one cuts it back and then gets a regrowth of uh, and a second crop. But the main problem with that strategy uh, where it's practiced still is uh, usually the yields are uh, considerably lower, maybe 40 or 50 percent of the initial crop yield. And uh, one can't really go on to a, another retune crop after that, and again another one because the yields drop too much, so it's not economical. In the past uh, 30 years, most of farmers uh, go to city for uh, looking for new job. So in the, uh, uh, for agriculture production, and lease and lease labor, uh, for this work. So this perennial, um, perennial crops uh, is, should be coming for agriculture, for this farmer in all of the world, I think so. I was introduced to perennial crops in high school through Wes Jackson's book, Becoming Native to This Place. And that actually inspired me to move from chemistry uh, into plant breeding, which is the field I'm in now. And so my lifelong and career goal is really to develop some perennial germplasm or some perennial varieties that can be, then be used to test hypotheses of whether they're actually better or not. The, the interest I have in perennial crops is maybe maintaining or slightly increasing yield, but doing so in a manner that will protect the ecosystem, uh, protect soil erosion, which is one of my lar largest concerns, and maybe use less inputs so that the food we do produce is produced more sustainably, so maybe we won't degrade our environment so uh, yields can continue to be ma maintained. Whether or not they can be increased or not, I think, is an, an open question and a hypothesis to be tested. I don't know enough about the economics or the labor demand, the whole issue of weed problems and so on, of two broadcast zone crops rather than a single transplanted plus a routine crop. And it seems to me that that is an area that uh, ERI, the Rice Research Institute, uh, could very readily undertake which is economically and environmentally less damaging, more sustainable, and that is what we are after. We are going to be forced into change in the rice industry. The opportunity cost is now very, very considerable. In many countries, rice farming is now only a part-time activity. This means that we have to do more with less. That is the challenge. I think we're up to it. I think the interesting thing about perennial crops is that there's two areas of research going on. We have perennial crops that already exist in the form of many tree crops and other perennials. And then we have annual crops that we're trying to develop into perennial systems. And the great thing is that in the perennial tree crops and clonal crops that we already have domesticated, we have really great study systems that we can take knowledge from and transfer to these annual crops that we're trying to develop. And the really interesting thing about the extant perennial crops, in particular tree crops, is that they have some really interesting features that aren't present in most annual systems. And these include things like a very low level of a genetic bottleneck, so they have very high diversity, and that gives us a lot of genetic variation to work with. And that's particularly important because oftentimes plant breeders are kind of stymied by a lack of variation in their annual crops. And I think it's also important to point out that these perennial crops 
are differentiated from their and from their wild progenitors despite a very low level of genetic bottlenecks so despite high levels of variation they show phenotypic and genetic differentiation so this indicates that we can really domesticate a plant without necessarily erasing all of its genetic variation and i think that's an important lesson especially for people who are not trying to change an existing annual crop but to bring a new perennial crop a new perennial plant into a domesticated status that it's really possible that you don't have to lose variation and that you can affect the phenotypic changes and genetic changes that you desire without losing the variation that's so valuable in that plant so perennial crops have been domesticated for thousands of years, and in every center of domestication, every place in the world where agriculture originated, um, a whole suite of perennial crops were, were brought into cultivation. So we can think of things like olive trees or grapevines or orange trees or apple trees. These are things that have been that have been grown for thousands of years as perennials. Um, I think what's being worked on now is kind of improving the quality and yield of those traditional perennial crops, but then also developing new perennial crops from these things that have been traditionally grown, um, grown as annuals. Development of um, perennial crops, particularly uh, perennial cereal crops, which is my interest, uh, is, is as much about the development of novel farming systems as, as it is about germplasm. So the development of a new crop is not just about plant breeding, it's about developing a system which is, is uh, simple enough and, and usable enough that farmers, once this technology is available to them, can go and use in their farm. And, and that's, that's going to be critically important for us, firstly, to get farmers to use perennial crop technology, but also to get the most out of perennial crops, you know, to get the, the broad adaptation that we'll need to have the environmental benefits, of the effect of, on the environment and the production benefits that we're all, all anticipating. There's a bit of a challenge in terms of a perennial grain crop that only, produce, was, only produces grain. So it means that we have to have much higher grain production levels than, than we currently have in our material. But what our work has also shown is that if you are able to use a perennial grain crop for grazing from livestock, that that actually greatly reduces the yield required for a perennial grain crop to be profitable. If you provide a small amount of forage, particularly early in the growing seasons, it's greatly, it greatly improves farm production and can have some pretty significant economic benefits, um, particularly when they're adopted on parts of the farm where current production systems are less profitable or productive. There needs to be a major investment uh, in the development of the perennial grain uh, programs around the world if we're ever going to uh, meet this, uh, this, 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 uh, this opportunity. With the uh, new technologies concerning soil uh, sustainability, that is uh, just to have a sod seeding, to have uh, leaving the remaining biomass on the soil, etc., to have the possibility to really improve both our production and to have also the improvement of our environmental situation in such a way that our children and our nephews could have a decent life and could have also a possibility of exploiting their life in the right way. need to food the world. Food is something that is very nutritious. It is something that makes a person achieve his full potential. We need to make real food. That's what we will do. You give me 10 brilliant students that normally go into rocket science or something like that, and we will food the world. Thank you. <laughs>